I remember as a little kid, occasionally we would go over my sister and I to my grandparents' house on a Friday night. My parents would drop us off at about 4.30. Dinner would always be between 5 and never, ever later at 5.30. No, no need to burn that midnight oil. And we would sit down, and it didn't matter what the meal was. We would always have bread and butter, and it was just for some reason so much better at my grandparents' house. There's just something about grandma's cooking. Even if your grandma's a terrible cook, there's just something about grandma's cooking that's delicious. And, and we, would, we would eat dinner, and then there would always be dessert. And I couldn't believe that there was a house where there was always dessert after every meal, because that was for a foreign concept to the house I grew up in. I mean, you were lucky if there was an ice cream carton in the freezer. But we're talking pies and cakes and brownies, you name it. Just always dessert after the meal. And we would eat our dessert. And then we would go downstairs. And we would watch the 6.30 news. Because <laughs> what kid doesn't want to watch the 6.30 news with their grandparents? And we would watch the 6.30 news. And then at 7, we were in for a real treat. Wheel of Fortune. It was great. It was great. And after, after, the, news, after the news would come on, we, we would have to change the channel. Now, for those of you who've been born in the last 25 years, I'm about to try to describe to you something you're not going to understand. And you're not going to believe that in a free country, people used to operate this way. It's going to sound very restrictive and very primitive. But when the 630 News would sign off, and it was time to change the channel for Wheel of Fortune, I would have to get off the couch literally walk to the television set. And then there were these two knobs on the right-hand panel of the TV that you would have to turn, and they would make a clicking noise. And if you turned the wrong one, the picture would just go crazy. It was insane. I'm like, what? what in the world is this? This is, this is terrible. And then I would finally be able to dial it in. And my grandparents, they weren't like, oh, honey, switch the top one two times. No, this was sport for them. To watch a six-year-old struggle to discover the channel for Wheel of Fortune. And, and then at 7.30, I would get up and change the channel again for Jeopardy, not because I cared about Alex Trebek, but because at 8 o'clock, Family Matters was going to be on ABC. And I had to see what was going on with Steve Urkel, and for those of you who've never watched Family Matters, do yourself a favor and subscribe to Hulu because every season is now on Hulu. You're welcome. You're welcome. But I didn't want to be late to see what antics Steve would be getting in, and so I would have to go up and I would have to practice literally which knob on the television set to turn and what channel was what. And now you fast forward to my house. And my kids act like it's the end of the world when they can't find the Apple TV remote. They literally start melting down and wondering how, if there is a loving God, why could the Apple TV remote be missing? Never mind the fact it was them who slid it under the couch 10 minutes earlier. But they cannot find the remote, and they freak out. And if they can't find it within two minutes... It is meltdown mode because, heaven forbid, they have to wait two minutes to start the Lion Guard episode that they want to start right now. In my day, kid, you were late two minutes. You just had to guess what happened in that whole episode. You may be right or you may be wrong, but you had no clue what really happened. And that's why we have imagination. And that's why I worry about the next generation. Because all they do is cry about the remote for two minutes until they find it and then start their show, which is streaming and they don't understand the struggle that I grew up in whatsoever. I think most of us would agree new things are better. <laughs> new things are better. I mean, think back. Think back to, to even just television. Maybe some of you grew up in an, in an age where you had to Maybe some of you grew up where there was no television, all right? We'll go way back for the Ray Leonardsons and everybody else here, all right? <laughs> so you grew up like... You were all gathered around the radio, like, ooh, Paul Harvey, tell us what happens next, all right? And then, 
And then your world was blown. It was blown crazy. And then, and then you were all gathered around, and when Elvis started that grotesque dancing on Ed Sullivan, you just knew Jesus was coming back in a couple weeks. But now, now think about what you have. Now think about what you have for television. I mean, that's just one thing, but think of what technology has done. And there's not one person, not one person who would trade their full HD TV set now that you can get for under a hundred bucks at Walmart for a decent size. I mean, it's not going to be huge, but for a decent size television, full HD, under a hundred bucks at Walmart. Just think of the, the leaps and the bounds that we've made in technology, and we would agree that new is better, and we don't really want to go back. We don't really want to go back to the days where you have to stand up and, and turn the knobs on, on the panel on the right side and maybe get static or maybe luck into a channel. But new is, is better in that regard. And this morning, we're going to look at a portion of Scripture from the book of 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and it's a letter that the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, wrote to a church in Corinth. And he's talking about this distinction of of new. And he's talking about it in relation to those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus. And so if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there. Otherwise, it will be on the screens as I start reading from 2 Corinthians 5.17 where we read these words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So the first thing we have to understand is there's there's a statement that therefore if. This isn't universal. This isn't universal. This is the choice that you have. This is the choice that you have to make, that every single one of us has to make. Nobody can make it for us, no matter how much our parents love us, no matter how much our spouse loves us, no matter how much our grandparents loves us, no matter how much our friends love us, it doesn't matter. This is a choice that each and every one of us has to make. And it's not universal, it's, it's our choice. It's, it's, do, we, do we want to take part in this or not? Therefore, if, so it's not universal, it is a choice. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, the Bible tells us you're literally a new creation. You're new. The old, the old is gone. The old you isn't who you are anymore because of the work that Jesus does within you. Those regrets that you carry around, some of you that that just cripple you and they paralyze you and they make it so you can't move and you can't function. And everywhere you turn, there's a reminder of your past. There's a reminder of your mistakes. There's a reminder of all the things you've done that you regret. And it's crippling to you. And I just want you to understand that if you've made the decision to follow Jesus, those things can't hold you down anymore unless you choose to let them. And the enemy are our adversary will come and he will whisper and he will try to weigh you down. But in Jesus, you're brand new and you're no longer defined by those mistakes and you're no longer defined by those regrets and you're no longer held captive to those choices that you made. You are brand new. And at the same time, I want to remind us that for those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus, we're brand new. And for some of us, it's time to start acting like it. We're new in Christ, but we're not acting like it. And we're free in Jesus, but we don't act like it. And God has made us new, and yet we go back to what we understand. We go back to who we are and what we did before we made the decision to follow Jesus. And the Bible tells us that in Christ we're new, but we're sure not acting like it. And we're acting 
in the same way we were before we made the decision to follow Jesus. If you have made the decision to follow Jesus, you are a new creation. The old you is dead, and it's time to put it in the ground. Are you trading the new to return to the old? He continues in verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is from God. This is from God. It's literally what God has done on our behalf. It's not something that you can do or something that you can earn. The reason for that is very simple. God has a standard. God doesn't grade on, a, grade on a curve. God has a standard. And it's pass-fail, which is good news. Everybody, everybody knows, all right, this is what we're dealing with. The bad news is the standard's perfection. That's where we're like, I'm out. Right? It's not good. And if the standard was good, think about it. If people were like, but I just, I'm a good person. So that should get me into heaven. Well, define good for me. Define good for me. Because your definition of good and my definition of good are probably going to be similar. But they're going to be different. Now, introduce people from cultures outside of our own and ask them the question. And from some cultures, it's going to align very, very closely, very similarly. And yet from others, the answer to this question is going to be vastly different. Some of you may be living exemplary lives. You may be some of the best people that this world has to offer. But understand this, the standard of God is not good. The standard of God is perfection. Bible in Romans tells us, for all have sinned, all have made the choice, and they fall short of God's standard. And yet God in his infinite love for us loved us enough that he offered us a way to be reconciled to him. But understand, the standard is perfection. And so it doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter how many good things we do. We can't make it because the second, the second we make a mistake, the second we do something we regret, the second we make a choice that rebels against God, we can no longer meet the standard of perfection. That's what we're up against, every single one of us. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So God still loves us in spite of the fact that we don't meet his standard. So much so that he sent his son Jesus so that we could have a relationship with God And he reconciles us. This is the love of God on display. This is the work of God and the reason that Jesus came, that we could be reconciled to the creator that we rebelled against. God saved us. And oh, by the way, the reason that we're still here at the time God saves us is he gives us a job to do. And so we now partner with God in the ministry of reconciliation. We take this message to others. We take the hope that we've discovered and we share it with the world. He continues in verse 19. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Not counting their trespasses against them. They occur, but he covers them. This is, where we, this is where we fall short of that standard, and yet God looks out because of what Jesus has done for those who make the decision to follow Jesus, and he says, you have trespassed, but I no longer count that against you. It's not that it was never there, but it's covered. God covers them not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Did you catch that? This is phenomenal. Entrusting to us. 
That in this message of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and the immense love that God has for us, this message, which is the most important message in all the world, how has God chosen to best convey that message through you and me? Not because God needs us, lest we be confused but because God chooses to utilize us that we could partner with him in the most important message this world has to offer. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You are God's ad campaign. You. How do you want to present the message? Are you infomercial guy or girl? Time's running out. Got to go now. Time's running out. Got to go now. Time is running out. Got to go now. Are you like the ambulance chasers? Got the skeezy looking actor and the neck brace and Then they come on in the cheap-looking suit and put their arm around them. Are you a good representation? You're the ad. You. You and I, we are the ads that God chooses to use for the most important message this world has to offer. Let's make sure we live our lives in a way that some people who are like, oh, great, advertisements. And I'm that guy. I love to skip ads anytime I can. I've got the ad block on the, on the Chrome, and every website I visit now is like, please disable your ad block. Nope. Always look underneath that giant button of click here to disable the ad block. Is this minuscule thing you can click on that says, no, absolutely not. Why? Because I don't like to be inundated with ads. Hate it. But around every February, generally around the Super Bowl, there's one or two. There are one or two ads that are out there that I go to YouTube and rewatch because it's so well done. I am a man who hates advertisements and I proactively seek these out because they're so well done. They're funny or they're gripping and they're entertaining and they're just really well done. And so let's make sure in a world that is increasingly rejecting the cause of Christ, in a world that would kind of roll their eyes and a world that says, I don't want any part of that. Let's make sure that we live our lives in such a way that we are the ads for Jesus that people are like, hey, you know what? I want to see that again. I want to learn more. God's entrusted us with the most important message this world has to offer. Let's make sure we're good representatives. We've said it ad nauseum over the past few weeks, and we're going to continue to say it because it really drives our DNA. It drives who we are. But Lakeside exists to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from him. And guess what? You are our ad campaign. The relationships you have with your neighbors, with your friends, with your coworkers, you are our ad campaign. And the reason for that is because you're Jesus' ad campaign. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He, he continues, he says, you're ambassadors You're ambassadors. You're living in a foreign land. And I know right now that we look at our society and it's just crazy what's going on. It's insane. And it's just tragedy after tragedy and outrage after outrage. 
And it's, we, we just see this world that's so desperate in need of love and in need of hope and in need of, of just perspective. And there's just a void of that everywhere we turn. And he says, hey, for those of you who've made the decision to follow Jesus, guess what? You, you are God's ambassadors. So in the same way that the United States sends ambassadors to go reside into foreign lands and to proclaim the interests of the United States in those foreign lands, that is what we are here in this world. For those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus, we are his ambassadors. But for some of you who think, oh man, everything's hopeless. Everything, everything in this civilization is, is just, it, it's not going well. Again, I just encourage you, read the New Testament. We've known this is the way we're going to trend for a couple thousand years now. And it's right there. So just start reading it. None of this, none of this should catch you by surprise. On the, sa- on the other side, don't lose heart. Your citizenship is in heaven with God. You are an ambassador here, but this isn't home. And I know the times can be scary. And I know it can seem like there's no hope. And I know that there are situations that none of us would wish that we would have to engage and we would have to endure. But it's all the more reason that we must live lives of love. And we must take the hope that we have found through Jesus and proclaim it to a world that's in desperate need. He implores you. Our message and our plea is to follow Jesus. And that is our message and our plea today. Maybe you're here and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. And so for you, this world is all you have to hope for. I want to offer you something better. Maybe you're here and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. And all you have to grasp at is that you can be a good person or you can do enough. And that maybe you can forget or minimize some of, the, some of the things you've done in your past, some of those mistakes that you've made. If you just distance yourself enough, then, then maybe you can just make yourself numb to them, but they're still there and they will haunt you. We implore you on behalf of Christ, there is a better way. You be reconciled to God. How? How's that possible? With a God who has a standard of perfection, how could I possibly be reconciled when I am imperfect? As good as I may be, how could I be reconciled to God when I do not meet the standard of perfection? What hope is there for me because I don't measure up and I don't make it? And 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us this. For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That means all of my mistakes and all of my imperfections, all of my faults, all of my shortcomings, all of my trespasses against the perfect standard of God have been taken care of so that God sees my trespass, but He sees that it's covered. Because God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for me. So that in Jesus, in what he accomplished and what he did, I could be made right with God. That I could discover hope. That I could be seen as perfect.
And so Jesus humbled himself. And he roamed this world. The full confines of God within the confines of humanity. Fully God, fully man. He was, of course, perfect as, as God is, and as is his standard. And he came with a mission. And that mission was you and me. The Bible tells us in Romans, the cost of our mistakes, the cost of our sin is death. So in order for our trespasses to be covered, that penalty had to be paid. And that price was paid by Jesus. Who was crucified. Who went upon a cross, which was a common means of execution in Jesus' day. Where they would take a criminal... And they would outstretch their arms. And they would drive nails through their wrists. And they would drive nails through their feet. Right above the ankle. And they would hang them up. On a wooden cross. And because they were nailed, they would have to pull their bodies up to gasp for oxygen. It was an incredibly painful way to die. And that's the price that I owe. Because of everyone I've hurt. Because of my selfishness of every lie I've told because of every regret that I have in my life that would haunt me if it had the chance that was my responsibility but in my place was my creator the very one I rebelled against. Whose love for you and love for me led him to take our place. He breathed his final breath cried out, it is finished. And then he paid the price. And the death, which is the cost of all of our mistakes, that debt was paid. And three days later, Jesus rose again, appeared to over 500 witnesses, which right now doesn't sound that impressive, but over 500 witnesses in that day who could individually verify that Jesus was, in fact, alive. And the message... Has lasted for over 2,000 years because of ambassadors is the message that is available to you today. And it calls out and it says to you, quit carrying your hurts. Quit dragging around your regrets. Quit trying to be enough because you can't measure up and you're only going to destroy yourself trying. At 
accept what God has done on your behalf. We exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from him. And today, I just want to invite you that if that's you, it's time. It's time to quit fighting. It's time to quit trying. And it's time to be made new. So I'm going to whisper a prayer here in a minute. And if you're tired of fighting and if you're ready to make the decision to give your life, to let Jesus save you, then you can repeat a prayer that I'm about to pray. And there's nothing magical about the words that I'm about to say. But it is a guide for what you understand that Jesus has done and what he wants to do in you. And then the band's going to come and we're going to play a song and we're going to pass out communion. And if you've made the decision to follow Jesus, whether or not you're a member of Lakeside, that doesn't matter, wherever. It doesn't matter. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, we invite you to take this. And just hang on to it. We'll come, I'll come out and we'll take it together. But this is a reminder of the cost of our freedom, the cost of our redemption, and the love that Jesus has for us. And let it also be a reminder to us today of the incredible ad that we are to be and the hope we can have because of what Jesus has done, that we are new. And the old is dead. So let's live like it. God, I pray right now for the people here who've never made the decision to follow you. And I pray right now in the quietness of this room, in their hearts, God, they would make the decision that it's time And so right now, God, I pray that they would, just, they would just repeat after me in their heart to you. God, I know I've made mistakes. God, I know I've fallen short of your standard. I'm a sinner. And I need you to save me. I know you love me. I know Jesus died for me to pay the price for those mistakes and pay the price for my sin. So God, I'm asking you to make me new. Forgive me. Save me. Help me live as yours. God, thank you for making us new. Help us remember your sacrifice.